Welcome back to another one of my shitty vlogs. And in today's vlog, I'm gonna talk about my experiences with Kotlin multi-platform mobile. That is building a cross-platform app using Kotlin. So more specifically, what I'm gonna be talking about is the specifics of the project that I built. So like, what architecture did I use? What did I use for the caching client? What about the network client? Did I use dependency injection? What were the kind of hangups that I ran into, if any? And just generally, you know, how, how did it go? Was it smooth sailing? Did I get the iOS version up and running easily? Did I get the Android version up and running easily? Was there problems? Just kind of talking about my experiences. By the way, before I get into the video, if you don't know what Kotlin Multiplatform is or Kotlin Multiplatform Mobile, I made a video about it. So you can go and just click that card that I'm going to put up there in the top, uh, one of these corners anyway, and click that and go watch that video and you'll find out all about it. How do you build apps or what is this Kotlin Multiplatform thing? How do you build apps for iOS and Android using Kotlin? So for those of you who do not know, I spent a week on iOS development and I spent a week working on a Kotlin multi-platform project. So two weeks ago, I started with iOS, spent a week on it learning Swift UI because I know absolutely nothing about Swift, about iOS development. And I thought if I'm gonna build a cross-platform app using Kotlin multi-platform, I better learn some Swift because I still have to build the UI. The Kotlin multi-platform will share the business logic, but you still gotta build the, the presentation layer basically on both iOS and for Android. So I needed to learn some iOS. And now I have a cross-platform app ready to go. So why not do a little demo? Here I have in front of me an iPhone 12 running my recipe application. It's getting data from a real API. It's caching that data. It's then displaying that data. And here I have over here the same exact app. It's using This is using that Kotlin multi-platform mobile project that I bought, or that I, that I bought, that I built. I did not buy it, I built it. And uh, this is the Android client. So basically the apps do exactly the same thing. They share business logic. The UIs are just implemented on the two separate clients. So it's a simple app. Those of you who watched my Jetpack Compose course will be very familiar with this because this is essentially the app that we built. It's a recipe app. If I click on a recipe, it takes me to a detail screen where it shows you know, the ingredients, the date, the score, the image, the title, and I can go back and you know browse different recipes. I can also search for recipes. So like if I wanted to search for recipes with kale, for example, I don't know why I searched for kale. I don't like kale, but it's what came to mind. There we have a bunch of recipes with kale and same thing, click on them, get the detail. Now there's also a sort of um, a filtering system up here. So up at the top, you'll see there's some chips. I have an error chip. This one will actually just force an error so because I was trying to get you know dialogues to work. So if I click OK, that gets dismissed. But if I click on some of the other categories, it will search that particular category. So pizza will give me recipes with pizza and you know whatever. I think you get the idea. So the Android client is exactly the same. It's identical other than you know different system specific features i can you know search for kale over here just like i did in the ios version of course there's actually more animations in the android client because i'm an android developer i'm not an ios developer i don't know how to make it look good on ios so my ios one kind of looks like garbage there's a nice you know shimmer animation here in the android client which is not present in the ios client and there's a bunch of other kind of little things just because again i'm i'm not an ios developer so same app, you know, you can click on it, takes you to a detail screen, shows the ingredients. And, you know, I think uh, I think you get the idea Two two apps call them multi-platform. They're sharing business logic. Now, before I talk about how I shared the, you know, the networking client, the caching client to talk about dependency injection, I think it's important to talk about what architecture I chose to use for this KMM project. Architecture here is really important because with a KMM project, essentially what you want to do is you want to maximize the amount of code that you you can write with pure Kotlin. You want to maximize the separation between the presentation layer and all of the other code in the project because that way you can share it. If it's a cross-platform app, we want to write as much as possible with Kotlin because that way we can use that code in the iOS client and also that code in the Android client. That being said, I think the perfect architecture for a KMM, a cross-platform project with Kotlin is clean architecture. Clean architecture maximizes separation of concerns. If you don't know what separation of concerns is, 
it means you build essentially little components and those components talk to each other and send data back and forth between each other and they can function as individual little pieces so they it's like uh you don't you don't couple you do loose coupling i guess is another way to put it that would be like the opposite of separation of concerns you want to maximize these little independent components and separate them out so if you have no experience with clean architecture it's going to be a little bit confusing to you to look at this diagram but i built a diagram and i'll just kind of explain it so down at the bottom here i have a the, the first main kind of separation is the business logic which is pure kotlin and the framework which would be ios and android specific so down in the framework section we have basically just the uis so we have the observer here this is like the end user they'd be looking at either the swift app or the ios app or the android app which is built with jetpack compose so ios app is built with swift ui android app is built with jetpack compose at least the the ui portion and that's the presentation layer so then the presentation layer, how does it talk with the rest of the code for the project? Well, that's through the use cases, or in other words, the interactors. Some people call them interactors, some people call them use cases. I like to call them, I actually named the package structure interactors, but I call them use cases, so I kind of do both. But anyway, the presentation gets its data from these quote unquote use cases. Now in more practical terms, a use case is just something that can happen. If you can imagine an app, uh, the recipe app, for example, what can happen in the UI? Well, it can, you know, search for recipes. That would be one thing that can happen in its UI. So that would be a use case because there's a bunch of logic that gets packaged up into that, you know, quote unquote use case. Well, what is that logic? Well, when they search for recipes, you need to do a bunch of different things. Number one is you need to get the data from that network using, you know, the search query, using the page number, if you're using pagination stuff like that. So you get the data from the server, but then you don't want to just display the data from the server. You got to do more things. You got to like, uh, you know, cache that data. So you'd insert it into the cache. Then you would emit the data from the cache because you want to actually look at the cache. You don't really want to look at the network data. You want to be looking at the cache anyway, if you want to obey the single source of truth principle. So get the data from the network, insert it into the cache, emit the data from the cache. Those are kind of the three core things that you would do in that specific, you know, quote unquote use case. But then there's also error handling. You would want to catch any, you know, specific errors unique to getting that data from the network, specific errors get from getting that data from the cache, uh, specific from inserting to the cache, and maybe specific from emitting. So there's all of this sort of quote unquote business logic that's wrapped up into that one particular use case. So that's a beautiful thing about this, this clean architecture thing is we can separate all that stuff out into pure Kotlin code so it can be shared on the iOS and the Android client. So like I said, we have our use cases and then the use cases gets its arguments or its dependencies, I guess you could say, from the different data sources. So we have the caching data source, which we used with, which I used SQL delight for. So that is a, uh, a Kotlin, a pure Kotlin third party library that we can do caching, do SQLite uh, caching on the iOS client and the Android client. And then we have the networking data source, which I used KTOR for. KTOR is great, by the way, but I'll, I'll talk more about that in a few minutes. And then the data source talks to our domain, which contains kind of our main sort of business logic or our business models. So in terms of like the recipe application, which I just showed you, one example of like a domain model would be the recipe model. You know, what does a recipe, what sort of, uh, I guess, fields does a recipe has have? It has an ID, a title, uh, the publisher, the ingredients, the image, all that stuff. And that would be kind of one of those core business models that never change. That is the, the one of the models that is central to the application and how it functions. Why don't we take a gander in Android Studio and just show you kind of how the, the code is, uh, how the code is in here. So we have the Android app module, which is where all the Android specific stuff is. So this is where all of our, you know, Jetpack Compose components are gonna be, any activities that we have, um, things like that, you know, Android specific things. Now in the iOS app, module obviously that's where the ios stuff is the swift ui stuff and then the shared module this is where kind of all the magic is if we go into this common main section here this is all the shared code that gets sh gets shared on through both platforms so you you could probably recognize domain and data source just like we talked about in that diagram that i had up here so domain and data source and then we also have interactors so domain data source or data source domain interactors that stuff is all shared and it's pure kotlin code now i also have a presentation section here which you might think is a little weird because 
you said, you know, Mitch, uh, presentation is, you know, specific to the platform. Well, there's also some presentation logic that could be shared, like the different events that happen in the different screens, for example. So like in the list screen, here's the different events that can happen. We can have a new search event. We can do a next page event for page nation. And then also we have restoring the uh, state after process death. This one's actually an Android specific one, but I, I left it in here anyway. Now, the other kind of packages that we have, the ones I want to point to are inside of data source. So inside here we have our caching client and we have our uh, networking client. So like I said, the network client was built using Ktor. And if I open up this recipe service implementation, Ktor is really simple. Ktor is awesome. It pretty much, well, I mean, we, I have a simple use case case because I'm only doing get requests, but still like my experience has been very positive with Ktor. Basically, you just create a client, which I have here. You define a serial because you got to serialize and deserialize the data depending on if you're you know getting or setting data to the API and then you have different functions for doing the transactions so for me I have two get requests you can see client.get client.get you basically just pass the URL any authorization that you need for me I have just some basic token authentication here so it's just passing the token and there we go works great I can share that between both the iOS client and the Android client now SQ delight on the other hand is what I used for for the caching and this was you know not necessarily that simple to set up I had some problems with this but it was it was mainly because of gradle configuration issues it wasn't like you know just sq delight on its own I actually got sq delight to work really quickly on the Android client but I had some issues with the iOS client it wasn't importing the native driver to use I guess use sq light on use sq light on uh, iOS so there's some gradle configuration issues shout out to John O'Reilly Riley, by the way, thank you very much for helping me. I am certain I would have spent many, many, many more hours trying to get that to work if you didn't help me. I I know almost nothing about Gradle, so debugging a Gradle issue is just not gonna be easy for me. So thank you very much for helping me. I don't even know if I would have got it to work, to be honest. I was ready to build uh, two caching clients, one for iOS using core data and one for Android using Room. I was I was ready to do that. I came to work on Monday thinking that I, or no, sorry, I left work on Friday thinking on Monday that's what I was gonna do. He reached out to me on the weekend and said, hey, I heard you were having some problems and helped me. So thank you very much. Go follow him on Twitter, he's a nice guy. So yeah, SQL Delight works by, you write these raw SQL queries. So like here, let me just open this up. You define these raw SQL queries. So like here's how I would create the recipe entity table, how I you know select all the recipes, insert recipes, uh, search recipes, get all the recipes, get a recipe by its ID. You define the um, the queries like this in this uh, .sq file. This is just like how SQ Delight works. And then when you build the project, there's more configuration to do obviously, but kind of generally speaking, this is, this is the bulk of what you do. Then when you build the project, a bunch of code gets generated. So if you go into build, go into generated and go into SQL delight, a bunch of code here gets generated and we can then easily do basically SQL transactions uh, using Kotlin. So that's great, obviously, because we're building a KMM project. We want to do as much as possible with Kotlin. So SQ delight turned out to be a great great option for this. So maximizing the amount of Kotlin that you write so it can be shared on iOS and Android. That's the goal. So now what about dependency injection? Well, for my Android client, I used Hilt for dependency injection. I think Hilt is just great. It solves a lot of kind of problems unique to Android, like constructor injection into view models, stuff like that. But on the iOS client, I actually decided to just do good old fashioned manual dependency injection. So I'm passing dependencies through the constructor when I build the uh, build the objects, but I, I really don't feel the need to use a third party library. You know, one of the big reasons why we use third party libraries on Android to do dependency injection and why it's such a big thing on Android is because we have to deal with the different life cycles. We have to deal with the, uh, you know, activity life cycle, fragment life cycle, service life cycle, application life cycle, view model life cycle, all these different life cycles. And when something like when a rotation occurs, for example, the activity gets destroyed, it gets recreated, same with the fragments, whatever. So if you have something that is 
uh, some object that is instantiated in there, it also gets destroyed and recreated. So one of the reasons why we like dependency injection so much on Android is you can scope dependencies to the life cycles of certain components. So if you you know, have something scoped to the singleton scope. It will exist as long as the application is alive. If you scope something to the activity retain scope or whatever it's called, uh, it will live as long as the activity that it is defined in is also alive. View model scope, same thing, fragment scope, and so on and so on. So this is a way that we can kind of um, deal with these life cycle issues and we can say, no, no Android, I want this thing to continue living. Do not destroy this thing until this other thing dies. So with iOS, I um, I just didn't really see the need for it. You know, like for example, in my view, I just declared my dependencies. Like I I built those objects, and then when I built my you know view model, it's an observable object. I passed those dependencies as arguments into that observable object, and then whether I rotate, navigate somewhere else, come back, it doesn't really matter. It just seems to kind of work. So it doesn't seem to have those you know life cycle issues that Android does. So as of right now, I am just doing you know manual dependency injection on the iOS client. I don't see a need to use anything more as of right now but maybe if the project was more complicated maybe if there was more moving parts i would need some kind of dependency injection solution but as of right now good old-fashioned manual dependency injection why not keep it simple why complicate things now one last thing that i want to talk about is unit testing so is unit testing easier in a KMM project? And the answer to that is yes. If you were to compare building an iOS client and an Android client totally separately, unit testing in a KMM project is easier. The reason it's easier is because all that Kotlin code, you only have to write one set of unit tests for. So if you consider our architecture diagram, you know, we have all of our use cases in the, you know, pure business logic, pure Kotlin kind of section. And that's really where the bulk of your unit tests are gonna be, if not all of your unit tests, it's gonna be testing the logic in these use cases. So all of your use cases for iOS and Android are gonna have one set of tests. So that's like a huge, huge time saver. So pretty big deal. You get to write, you know, one set of unit tests for both the clients. That's awesome. So what is next for me in this KMM journey? Well, I'd like to get more experience, to be honest. I'd like to get something in production. Currently, I actually have an Android app in production right now, and I've been wanting to build an iOS version for quite a long time. So I think I'm going to take this opportunity and build a KMM version of that project. So I'm going to have an Android client and an iOS client. I'll publish it to the or I'll update my posting on the Google Play Store and I'll publish it for the first time on the Apple or iOS App Store, whatever the hell it's called. And I just want to go through that process and just kind of see what it's like. I want to see if if I'm going to run into extra problems or any unknown problems, I guess, uh, in production. So I'll do that. I'll get uh, get that out. I don't think that'll take long. You know, uh, it's not a big app. It's a very simple app. It's uh, uh, for those of you who don't know, I'll put a card up here and you can go check out me uh, showing my app that I have on the App Store. And uh, yeah, I'll do that. I'll get some more experience and then I'll um, probably make a KMM course. That's probably the next thing. It'll be uh, it'll be Kotlin multi-platform with Swift UI for the Swift stuff and then uh, Jetpack Compose for the Android stuff. By the way, if you don't want to wait for that course, I have tons of high quality courses on my website. If you've never tried Jetpack Compose yet, this is the new UI building you know, toolkit, new declarative UI way to build UIs on Android. Go check out a course on that. I have a beginner's course made pretty much for complete beginners. So like if you know nothing about Android, you could just jump into that course and then I have a more advanced version of that course where we add on to it add some you know real architecture add you know a network client add some dependency injection add some use cases it'll clean architecture basically so if you want to know more about Jetpack Compose there's a beginner course an advanced course or if you've never heard of clean architecture you know I talked about clean architecture in this video it is definitely my favorite architecture I think that every app should probably be built with clean architecture because it makes testing easy it maximizes separation of concerns and it's great for KMM it's a beautiful thing and guess what I have a great course on clean architecture go to my website register check out that course also join the community on discord I have a private community for members only and uh, you know there's I don't know there's generally 60 70 80 people online at all times we talk about Android we talk about web development uh, I, I'm assuming we're gonna be talking about KMM pretty soon lots of stuff in there I'm in there every day lots of people are in there every day helpful people it's great go join 
you won't regret it. Also, if you ever wondered what people say about my membership, you can go up to testimonials right here. I think I have over a thousand testimonials at this point. Yeah, there's a thousand testimonials. So you can go and read through some of these, check out what people are saying about my website, my membership. I challenge you to find a bad review because they don't exist. I think there's maybe one or two and that was because the guy forgot to cancel his subscription and got billed. Don't worry, I refunded him anyway, but he still left a bad review. Jeez. Thanks for watching my shitty vlog and I will see you in the next one.